Hey everyone, this is Rudy for uh, Bester Investor. So um, what we're going to do today uh, on August the 29th, which is Saturday, is I'm going to review some of your comments that you shared with me on the uh, YouTube channel. And specifically, I'm going to look at a, a number of people who uh, have asked some questions. And um, if you uh, are interested in the um, sort of Q&A related to the comments, then uh, you can follow the first section. If you're more interested in the um, tender offers and debt notes, then uh, you can kind of maybe fast forward beyond the, um, the comments and the Q&A and go to the last couple of slides that I'm going to present uh, for you today. I'm going to try and go as quickly as I can. Um, this deck is a little bigger than usual because of the uh, extensive discussions. I really appreciate the fact that you're uh, chatting with me online and that you're watching my videos on Oxy. So uh, let's take it away and see uh, what's going on. So uh, the first thing I have to do is say Good Mittag Stefan Bock. So uh, Stefan is uh, in Germany and uh, he asked a question a little while back about um, the Oxy second quarter results and specifically he was saying um, Oxy said uh, we made a, an eight billion dollar per share loss last quarter uh, then we have share value around $28. I wasn't quite sure of the question, so I asked uh, him to clarify. And then Stefan very kindly wrote back again and commented, and he said, um, when Oxy announced their second quarter, they said we have $8.4 billion or $9.12 per diluted share as a loss for the quarter. Um, or otherwise, we have $1.6 billion or $1.76 per diluted share. Uh, so it's like, what did you actually lose? Did you actually lose $9 or, or $1.76? It's a fair question. Uh, Stefan, I had previously uh, mentioned in one of my videos that I made on a different topic that uh, accountancy is a very nuanced reporting discipline. Uh, and if you want to hire a new accountant, the first thing that you should ask them is, what's one plus one? And if they say, what would you like it to be? Then that's the guy that you want to hire. So if we actually look at the announcement, so um, Oxy, as you had quite rightly pointed out, said on August the 10th, they announced a net loss attributable to common shareholders for the second quarter of $8.4 billion or $9.12 per diluted share, and an adjusted loss, at loss attribu attributable to common shareholders of $1.6 billion or $1.76 per diluted share. What exactly is adjusted income? Now, adjusted income is a non-GAAP measure. GAAP, for those people who uh, don't know what that means, is the General Agreement on Accounting Principles. Now, you could argue that uh, accountants don't have any principles. That's a separate topic. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to uh, hold and say uh, adjusted income is a non-GAAP measure. So when we talk about the adjusted income, which is significantly different to GAAP, uh, what you can do there in the first place is say, why is there such a huge disparity? And then secondly, uh, why uh, specifically is GAAP um, income adjusted different from actual net income? So the difference there between the two is under GAAP, it just depends when you actually write um, the, the income or, or the loss attributable to uh, the shareholders off. In other words, do you do it in the quarter or do you do, you do it um, sort of amortized over a period of one year? Uh, how are you required to do that? There's no rule. In other words, no one's going to go to prison for misreporting this. This is just uh, subject to the company's reporting practice and, and how it is that they report their finances. So I'll give you a practical example which might help to explain it. Um, if I um, have a, a small business and I invoice one of my clients, in December of uh, 2019 uh, for a sale of $10 million. I have the uh, choice under GAAP to uh, record that sale, which is a purchase order in December of 2019, in order to uh, make my sales for the fiscal period, the quarter, or even the fiscal year 2019 look good, which means that uh, in 2020, I basically start with zero. On the other hand, you could say, um, those, uh, that particular order might be a future dated order and think uh, for practical purposes of a company like Boeing. 
They may get a purchase order today, which is uh, August 29, uh, 2020, for um, you know $3.5 billion for uh, 10 airplanes. But they may only be delivering those airplanes in 2030. So when do you report it? So under GAAP, unfortunately, there's this uh, uh, attribution where you can say, well, I'm reporting it right now because it makes my sales numbers look really good. Uh, or otherwise I'll report them as I sell them or whatever the case might be. So there's no hard and fast rule, and that's why you have this disparity. But it, it's worthwhile taking a little bit of time to find out exactly what this means or uh, where it comes from. So reported net income, though, uh, sort of from a good news point of view, so if you think of the net loss as attributable, uh, is considered representative of the management's performance over the longer term. So uh, when it comes to the management performance as a metrics, they actually look at the net loss and not the um, adjusted. But let's take a quick look and see where this comes from. So here's the net loss, Stefan, for the quarter, and here's the adjusted loss. And what I'm looking at specifically here is sort of that six point something billion dollar difference between net and adjusted. And it basically all appears in that section over here, oil and gas. All the other numbers uh, on their um, financials. And this, by the way, comes from the SEC filing. So this is what they filed with the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, all the other numbers that, that are sort of uh, uh, towards the bottom end of the um, table that I'm showing you right now are fairly similar. It's just that six point something billion dollar gap. So what is it? So over here, second quarter after tax items affecting comparability included impairment charges of 5.2 billion on oil and gas continuing operations and 1.4 billion in discontinued operations for total impairment charges of 6.6 .6 billion. Then you can ask what on earth is an impairment charge? So by definition, Stefan, and I'm going to wrap it up here. If you have more questions, get back to me again. In accounting terms, an impairment charge describes a drastic reduction in recoverable value of a fixed asset, but that is not what we're talking about here. Impairment occurs or can occur due to a change in legal or economic circumstances, such as the result of a casualty loss from unforeseen hazards. And I think we can all agree that the COVID-19 pandemic was a um, casualty loss or an unforeseen hazard, and so was the oil price. So they were quite rightfully able to um, write off an impairment charge of almost 6.6 .6 billion for Q2, which is actually, if you think about it, kind of cool, because that means it's already been written off in Q2. And on Q3, then we can actually sort of realistically, maybe optimistically expect that this is gone and all is going to be good from this point forward. Jimmy E says, it would be great if Vicky buys some shares now and, and, and appears more frequently on the media. I agree with Jimmy E. I think uh, Vicky needs to get out front there and uh, sort of uh, talk to people. Um, Oxy has lots of good news stories to tell. And uh, she's not necessarily sort of uh, in the forefront of the media's attention. And then Joe, who previously used to work at um, Oxy, says uh, Vicky is a strong visionary. She's a person of strong moral character. She's been extremely good to employees. He's only got good things to say about her. He says she's a fighter. Uh, Joe, I like Vicky as well. I think she's a strong manager and she's been at Occidental for more than 30 years. So. Uh, She's, uh, she's a strong CEO. I, I like um, Vicky. I like Vicky as a CEO. Uh, she's just down to earth and she just tells it like it is. Uh, Jimmy, I agree with you too. It'd be nice if they could actually have a sort of a, a spokesperson who's out there to uh, share the good news story about Occidental. About your comment about Vicky buying more shares, I'm going to come back to that one in just a second. Greg has a very interesting hypothesis here. He says, uh, there's no point in lowering your cost basis on the common because you might be able to make up for it with warrants. Uh, he says in three to five years, the stock may be trading at, say, $25 to $30, and then the warrants might be about 5 or 8 bucks or so. 
This is a re really interesting uh, hypothesis, uh, Greg. Thanks for sharing it. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's uh, it's a really um, interesting narrative for us as investors in Oxy to take a look at. Yaniv sent me quite a long uh, message. I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can because uh, I don't want to keep you guys too long, but I really appreciate the fact that we're having this conversation. Uh, Yaniv says he feels safe because uh, of people like uh, Carl Icahn and Warren Buffett investing in it. There's 70% institutional investment, which gives him a, a sense of comfort as well. Uh, he says Vicky bought $1.8 million worth of stock, so that's also to uh, uh, Jimmy E's comment in the previous uh, slide. I'm going to come back to that one in a minute, Yaniv, and respond to that one. Uh, Yaniv says Anna Darko and Oxy together cannot possibly be worth only $13 per share. I agree. Uh, Yaniv says in June, uh, there was a, a market spike and Oxy quickly raced to $25, giving us an indication of uh, its true potential. He also says it was good news on the vaccine. It might have spurred it. I'm going to come back to that one too, Yaniv. Um, Oxy recently sold uh, $1.3 billion worth of assets, putting some cash in the bank. Uh, oil prices have been stable at around $40 or thereabout. Um, he says Buffett sold his dividends and everything. Everyone thinks he'd quit uh, Oxy. Well, we know he didn't. Um, Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway, rather, to be more correct, wants his $200, billion, uh, $200 million in quarterly um, dividends or, or coupon on his preferred to be paid in cash. So as long as Oxy keeps giving him stock, he's just going to sell it because he wants the $200 million in cash. Oxy is part of the S&P 500. And that may or may not be a, uh, a big deal. And then uh, Yaniv uh, wraps it up with saying, uh, I think under Trump's uh, sort of threats to China uh, and the trade deal negotiations, um, Oxy exported to China, but Yaniv says he's not comment about that. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, Yaniv, in the first place, you're referring to uh, Vicky's purchase that she made in June of last year, where she acquired 37,460 Oxy shares at $48.15 per share. Uh, it's an awesome uh, trade by the CEO, a vote of confidence, right? It was also prior to the um, Anadarko acquisition. Uh, she might have expected to, uh, to get a quick um, uptick on, on that uh, transaction. It cost um, on the open market uh, $1.8 million, which is what Yaniv said in, uh, in, in the comments that I just referred to a minute ago. And those shares today are worth approximately $487,000. So uh, Vicky's holding them and obviously hoping for a nice uptick in the future. Uh, one of the reasons why we had the spike in June, Yaniv, is because OPEC uh, had a production cut in June. So the news about um, the vaccine and that might have had an impact as well, which is positive. But at the end of the day, OPEC had agreed to uh, cut production and they actually cut production by almost 10 million barrels per day. Um, so that impacted it. About your uh, comment and uncertainty about China, two Chinese companies have each booked five to six super tankers and each of them hold between two to five million barrels of oil, and that's for delivery for uh, August, September. That was reported um, by Reuters on uh, August the 14th, so just a few days ago. And uh, one of them was Oxy. So I'm gonna wrap it up with uh, a quick overview of Oxy's tender offers. So Oxy raised the max purchase price of its previously announced tender offers to 2 billion up from 1.5 billion. Who raises the price on its debt offers other than a company that sees some light at the end of the tunnel, especially when you increase your um, offers to, uh, to buy these notes from 1.5 to $2 billion because that's an increase of almost 30%. I'm not going to go through all the notes that they um, have referenced here, but they wrap uh, the uh, period from 21 to August 22, uh, 2022. So uh, it's basically all the notes uh, up until the end of 2022 that they're offering to buy. 
The tender offer is closed on July the 23rd. As per the SEC filings, Oxy had raised the least amount of money required in order to buy back these notes, and Oxy agreed to purchase and pay for the notes to the value of about 1.95 billion, which is an increase from their previous offer of about 1.48 billion. So that's the 1.5 to almost $2 billion uptick that was filed with the SEC at the time of closing. And you can say, what about the future debt? Because that's a good question. Well, Oxy is actually uh, busy negotiating um, and making tender offers on debt notes and senior notes that go all the way to 2030. I'm not going to dwell on this one because it's still in the future, so we're going to have to see what happens with this, but this is from the actual SEC filing. So when you see a table that looks like this, that is actually extracted from the Securities and Exchange Commission filing. Who's running the book on this? Pretty much everybody who is anybody. So the um, book runners include a number of uh, large financial institutions, as you can see over here, they are international as well. And the two joint book runners at the top of the page, JP Morgan and RBC. RBC is an acronym that stands for Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, they are the uh, joint book runners, uh, along with MUFG and SNBC Nikko, which is Japan. And then you have a, a number of uh, sort of junior book runners supporting the deal. And obviously you're going to be familiar with many of these names, Citigroup, Bank of America Securities, HSBC, Société Générale from France, Wells Fargo, right underneath the arrow that I'm drawing right now is Scotiabank, Scotiabank's Canadian bank, there's Standard Chartered Bank, which is a UK bank, there's, there's Wells Fargo, there's TD Securities, TD, is an acronym for Toronto Dominion, this Credit Suisse. Uh, you know, so there's a number of book runners and joint book runners and, and junior book runners running these notes offer for them. So Oxy is very, very actively um, working their debt book. Um, and as a long investor in Oxy, it gives me great confidence to see how actively they are managing their book. And this uh, screenshot that I'm sharing with you here is also from the Securities and Exchange Commission filing. So guys, I'm going to wrap it up on this note here. So uh, it's an overview of your questions and answers. I really appreciate the fact that we're building up a community of like-minded investors. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you're watching my videos. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you're commenting on, that, on them even more. Uh, let's stay connected. Let's help one another. And let's see Oxy uh, go from uh, zero to hero over the next few quarters in the next couple of years or so. Thanks for watching. Thanks for staying tuned in. This is Rudy uh, or Mr. Roxy signing off. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.